Strategy, друзья. Доброе утро из Сиэтла. Hey everyone, uh, good morning. Um, my name is Bob and welcome to Last Week in America once again. Um, once again, I am your host. My name is Bob. Um, I'm really happy you guys are joining me this morning. Currently, it's 8 a.m. in Seattle, Washington in the United States. Um, yeah, and honestly, it's kind of gross out today. It's, typically, it's sunny during the summer, but not today, I guess. Anywho, um, welcome to the uh, American Center Moscow uh, page and video. Every week, we do a Last Week in America discussion uh, for anyone who's here that's new. Um, before we really get into it, I just want to say uh, welcome and to check out the, uh, the American Center Moscow page, uh, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, they got a ton of really cool events. I know that uh, f about five days ago they had a stream from the ISS, which is the um, International Space Station. Uh, that was cool. I was looking on the page and I watched some of um, George R. R. Martin, uh, who is the uh, writer of Game of Thrones, which is like the hit, the hit American, and I assume like the hit global uh, show. So definitely check that out. And um, yeah, they had the whatever they had the American ambassador to Russia. Anyway, cool stuff. Check out their page. Good morning, hello, uh, Katerina. I guess good evening in Moscow. Um, hello, Timofey. I uh, hope you guys are doing well. Hope everyone is safe and happy. I'm happy to be here. Love talking to you guys. So uh, so today we're going to do something a little different. Um, I guess, kind of. It's actually, it is the 100th episode of Last Week in America, and I am honored to be the one who's hosting that. Um, I've only been here for about six, but that just shows that people enjoy it, So, which is pretty awesome. So we're going to do kind of a fun fact 100 thing. Um and then we're going to talk about a little bit about climate change. I'm trying to – the news cycle in the United States is relatively repetitive, so I'm trying to find some new different stuff to, to uh, cover that's not involved with protesting or involved with COVID. So, I mean, politics is such a big thing in the U.S., so I kept a little bit of that in there in here today in our conversation. For the most part, I got some cute pictures and stuff, so <laughs> excited for that. But um, – yeah, so uh, uh, anyway, let's, uh, I guess, without further ado, let's get into it um, and go to the first slide. And we have a picture here of, this is kind of my about me slide typically, and um, I just swear, for, if I have any new viewers, um, I would just like, like to introduce myself. My name is Bob. Uh, well, my real name is Robert, but my friends call me Bob. It's like the common nickname in the United States for that, well, one of them. Um, and I... I am from New Jersey, actually. I actually did a presentation in New Jersey uh, last week on the um, American Center Moscow page. You want to check that out. I'm talking about a place that I love. Um, but anyway, so I'm from New Jersey. I went to school in upstate New York, got my undergrad there, and now I live out in Seattle, Washington, where I'm going to get my graduate education, uh, my graduate degree and continuing my education. So I'm actually out for a master's in Russian and East European studies. I speak Russian and uh yeah, history. I love czarist history, and uh, that's why I've been kind of doing a lot of my research on. And also, I've been working on a lot of uh, looking at the development of like new media in Russia. So, anyway, that's kind of a little bit about me, and my interests um, in the classroom, outside of it. So, I include some pictures here, and they're kind of uh, the. This is so on the left. I'll just explain them first. I guess we have this is Husky Stadium uh, on the Mont Lake. It's known as uh, like their catchphrase is, uh, I think it's like the most perfect, perfect setting in all of college football because the whole back of the stadium looks out onto the lake. Uh, it's called the Mott Lake. And actually, before games, um, they, people do this thing called sailgating where they go and they'll uh, meet up with friends and family members and other students on the lake and uh, watch the uh, and before the football game starts. And then they'll actually they have a little ferry that brings them back. It's really cool. Anyway, and then on the right is actually the football team that plays there, the uh, University of Washington Huskies. We're, uh, we're actually very, very, very good. Um, we're pretty consistently, not this past in the top 10, but um, we kind of actually have some news on that front. Uh, football, finally, the Amer uh, U American football, uh, the NFL, which I would say is probably the finally made some comments and stuff so training camp for them starts this next week and they're 
seems like they're still trying to figure it all out with COVID um, and everything. So there's not really anything super official, but it's looking like it more and more that it will be back. So a lot of people in the United States are pretty excited. And um, they're uh, they're actually going to be playing. They, I mean, I assume that they're going to be playing with no fans. Uh, I, college football might not happen. Um, the schools already uh, – the University of Washington already said that it's not going to be traveling across the country because typically it travels and plays other top-ranked teams like in the South and Texas and Alabama and Florida and Georgia. So that's kind of where the football belt is, a lot of it. And then there's a lot of good teams up in the uh, Midwest. So – they, uh, they said that they're just going to be playing against other West Coast teams this season um, if it happens. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit about me. I love the sport, and obviously I can go on a tangent to talk about it for a very long time. But, um, yeah, hello, uh, Foyaz uh, Dira, I guess. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm I, If I mess up pronunciation, I am sorry. <laughs> that is a... Uh, I, I will try to I'll, I'll try to be better. But anyway, um, so yeah, so uh, let's get into it and uh, go to our next slide and talk about um, it's the hundredth episode. So I thought kind of a fun way to uh, celebrate it is to just do some funky uh, th- uh, give the funky fun facts about the United States and about the number a hundred. Originally, I was going to do oh, I want to do a hundred fun facts about the number one hundred and. It, it it just turned out to be, I was like, okay, I could be sitting here talking for hours about that. But, um, and surprisingly, there are a large amount of pages on the internet that have this information, which is, which is pretty funny. But, um, yeah, so, okay. So I just came out, so I chose 10, I chose 10. So this is the first five. And, uh, on the right, you see a picture of those are Scrabble pieces. So why Scrabble pieces? We'll get to it. I mean, I assume you could read, but anyway, so, uh. So the record number of points scored in, in one NBA game was a, by a single player was 100 points, and that was Will Chamberlain in 1964, I believe. I believe. That is um, – which is kind of cool. Um, so 100 pennies, which is one cent. So there's actually 100 pennies in a dollar, too. It's another fun fact. But um, they weigh a little over half a pound, which is uh, over eight ounces because a pound is 16 ounces. Um, there are a hundred letter tiles in a game of Scrabble, hence the Scrabble tiles. Um, there are a hundred yards, which is three feet. A yard is three feet, which is, um, it's really tough for me to convert this stuff to meters. Uh, I don't, I really don't know. I think it's a yard's closer to a meter. Um, but it's, it's just our bizarre, uh, American, and a uh, way to measure everything is yards and has the uh, impstum, but it's interesting. Nobody else uses it, obviously, in the world, of course. But um, so 100 yards in an American football field, and that's why it's an American football stadium field up there. So that, and then the United States has 100 senators. So that's actually uh, two senators per state. Um, Washington, D.C. does not have any senators because it doesn't have any representation in Congress. So, um, anyway, guys, yeah, just those are the first five facts. Don't let me know what you think. They're pretty interesting, and uh, it, it was pretty fun finding them. And uh, if we could go to the next slide, we got the next five. So, this is just – I don't know who these people are. This is just a giant pizza. So, But um, Americans eat about 100 acres of pizza each day. So, an acre, I looked it up, and it is 0.4 of a hectare. Um, so, I don't know. It's kind of like – it's the measurement that we use in the United States when measuring property uh, and measuring land is how many acres is that is typically the question. Like if you have like a farm or a piece of land, a larger piece of land in the like in the woods and stuff, it'd be like, oh, it's like a 50 acre piece of land or something. So that's kind of the way that they measure. I really don't know why they use that. I assume it's a historical. Uh, yeah, just just one of the those things uh i think there actually is like an exact way i think it has to do with like fence length and uh like the average length of like a roll of whatever like um i guess canvassing is that the right word i don't think that's the right word but i'm um, like uh when you measure out property and stuff so anyway um so they eat about 100 acres of pizza each day which is kind of gross but also i would think that it would be more to be honest <laughs> So, yeah, I would definitely. I was a little surprised that that was, that was funny. But um, and then so two thirds of the hundred dollar bills, which is the our, our largest bill that people use, I believe. 
I know there's some fun facts on like there was five hundred dollar bill once and stuff, and those are obviously not in print anymore. But um, the hundred dollar bill is the largest bill in print, uh, and two thirds of them are not in the United States. They're actually abroad, and a lot of them are in uh, foreign bank accounts, and a lot of them are. Um, used in underground markets such as like drug, uh, the drug world and such so a lot of them are actually just not in the united states at all which is which i found really interesting and kind of surprising but typically a lot of people don't use a hundred dollar bills that's not like the common bill um here's a recommendation if you go to the united States, uh currency that you take out like 20s um yeah, def- I take out twenty dollar bills. There, that'll be the easiest way to like pay. Um, if people are even using cash, I mean, card is is especially through these uh, COVID times. Card is kind of just taken over cash completely. I mean, more so than it ever has before. Um, anyway, uh, so a person who lives to be a hundred is called a centarian, um, and that comes from the word century, which means one hundred, uh, which means a hundred years is a century. Um. And then I guess that's from the Romans uh, century, but uh, the old Roman uh, military unit is why. But um, anyway, and then um, this was kind of cool. This is interesting. So in 1920, women gained the right to vote. So that was 100 years ago today. And that was a lot of that was pushed, actually, by the First World War and uh, women taking up larger roles in the workforce and stuff. So it's more of. Um, it was a really a big uh, a gender a large gender revolution in the United States, kind of redefining gender roles. And the Roaring Twenties is what the 1920s is known as in the United States before depression, before the Great Depression. That was kind of a a time of uh, in the United States. So they gained the right to uh, vote a hundred years ago, and that that was pretty interesting. You should definitely look more into it. So we have a question from Timofey uh, Prokol, uh, Prokopiev. I hope that is correct. It's probably not. But um, what is more popular in the U.S., pizza or sushi? Uh, I would say definitely pizza. So for sushi, you got to implies that, I don't know, I, I wouldn't go to like the middle of the country and get sushi typically just because it's not really close to the ocean. Oh, I did skip the third line. Thank you, Dana. Sorry about that. My bad. Yeah. So the 100 most common words in English account for 50 50- percent of all we speak or write and i actually um except for person every single one of those words is less than five letters so it's like the words like the and i I guess a or (laughs) i don't i don't know but yeah so so yeah the 100 most common words are half of the words that we actually use and write and it it makes sense i mean they're probably uh larger conjunction words and such. So um, articles like he, she, the, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, thank you, Dana. But um, back to Tim and Faye's question, definitely pizza. Uh, definitely pizza is more popular in the United States, I would say. And coming from the East Coast, I am uh, I am blessed by my, uh, I'm lucky. And I'm kind of a snob about my pizza because of it coming from the New York, New Jersey area. That's like, known as like the heart of pizza in the United States, um, as opposed to Chicago, which has deep dish, which is a little different, interesting. It's actually very, very, very good. A good deep dish pizza is very good. But um, uh, yeah, pizza is definitely large in the United States in my perspective. And sushi like isn't everywhere by the coast. We have a lot of them. But um, yeah, okay. So here uh, we have a question from Ludmila Vladimirovna. Uh, I've seen some videos about USA cafe food. So yeah, I think I think you're gonna. Um, it's actually I would say diner food is more of the right word for that. Cafe in the United States kind of more of implies like a coffee shop, and most people who go to cafes they don't really serve a lot for lunches and a lot of food. But uh, th- that's not the question. Anyway, I, that's but I would call it like restaurant food or diner food. Um, but yeah, so the question is why are they they're so por- uh, why are the portions so large? Um, I would have to say that's a good question. I, I don't know. We, we're kind of known for that. Um, that's kind of you, it's more of a you, you pay for what you get kind of thing. So I, I would say foods maybe a little probably a little bit more expensive. But no, the portions are just large, and that's kind of the United States. But the difference is in the United States there, and I've traveled a good amount, and I've gotten this feeling um, from other countries, whereas there's an in other, I feel like in the United States, there's not really an expectation to finish your food. 
So even though the portion is so big, you don't have to ta- uh, eat it all. And a lot of the times it's really common. Like I'll order something that I know is massive because I know that I only want to eat half of it now. And then I'll just take it home and use it as leftovers uh, for another meal. So a lot of times you actually get more meals out of it. Uh, so it makes sense. I don't, I don't know. It, it's kind of it's just an American thing, I guess. But the, the one thing is there's really no expectation to finish all of your food in the United States, unless you're like at a dinner party or something and someone prepares something delicious. It's, um, there's no real pressure at all. And even if you're offered second more food, it's totally cool to turn it down. Okay. Uh, so we have Valentina glower, uh, Valentin glower says, hi guys. Oh, I just wanted to ask, is it true in the United States? The most pizza, most tasty pizza you can find is in Chicago or maybe in Hawaii. Uh, I don't think so. I think, uh, New York city is the best pizza in the country. I, I like North Jersey pizza. Um, and then Long Island, which is uh, a place right outside New York City, has really good pizza, too. Uh, we have a question from Foyaz Diria. Uh, how many hamburgers do Americans eat daily? I have no idea, but it's probably a really embarrassing amount. Um, it probably just it, – it, I don't, I don't want to know is more of the uh, question for that. So anyway, guys, uh, we're going to go to the next slide and kind of just start and kind of continue this little discussion that we've been having already. Uh, awesome comments, by the way. Uh, if you have anything to say, throw it in the comment. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Feel free. Um, comments, it's pretty. It's it's uh, fun engaging with you guys and talking to. It makes the presentation go a lot smoother. So keep, uh, yeah, keep it up. Anyway, so this is kind of just the discussion, which is uh, where I have a few questions that hopefully you guys can uh, give some input on. But um, so, what was the most surprising fact to you? And uh, have you heard any other fun facts about the United States? So this one obviously is not like a big critical thinking uh, discussion like I've had in the past, but I just wanted to start off with something light and fun to kind of celebrate the 100th episode of Last Week in America. So um, the most surprising fact to me, hmm, that was actually a good one. Uh, The most surprising fact to me was uh, either... Will, uh, the, Will Chamberlain, the, the man who scored 100 points in basketball, that is a lot, a lot of points. So, um, And I believe at that time it was just two pointers that you could score. So uh, he scored and made 50 baskets in a game, which is incredible. Um, I know Kobe Bryant was up there uh, in his last game. Well, rest in peace, Kobe. But, um, yep, and then a... Um, that was pretty interesting to me. And then the hundred acres of pizza, which is, I, I know how big an acre is just, I, I, it's, it, I mean, it's like a piece of land. So like, I know how big an acre is and that is just disgusting. But then again, also surprising to me that it wasn't larger, which is really sad. <laughs> but, um, here we go. So we have a question from, um, Gag CF12, what oil is basically, uh, so I think you're looking for the word typically. So what oil is typically used for cooking food in the United States? Um, it depends who you are. I like to use, it depends on what you're cooking, I guess. I like to use olive oil, uh, preferably, but I know that vegetable oil is typically used when at home for frying. Uh, I know actual like fast food places and such, they'll use peanut oil or canola oil or grapeseed oil or just other, uh, oils from nuts to cook we don't um it's actually illegal to use um beef town which is like the oil from beef fat to uh fry food at fast food change fast food chains it's um not it's uh regulated by the fda just because of the big obesity crisis that happened in the united states and uh so you can't use beef town anymore but um i personally like to use olive oil um and i do a lot of italian cooking so that is probably why, but that or vegetable oil, depending on what I'm doing. I just got to actually a cast iron pan and it's been a lot of fun. So I definitely recommend uh, having one of those for cooking. It, it, may, it turns cooking from, in, from a chore into a hobby. But um, anyway, guys, yeah, no awesome questions and discussion already. Uh, yeah, so uh, kind of let's continue and we're going to go talk a little bit about polar bears. Uh, I'll go to the next slide. So the polar bears need our help. So uh, this is something that is not directly this past week. It happened, but this is something, a a new article came out. So this past week, an article came out that emphasized the effect of climate change on polar bear populations. Um, Polar bears, they live in the northern hemisphere in 19 subpopulations. So 
Yeah, all, all around the Arctic Sea. Um, and then they need sea ice, which is ice that is frozen from the, on, on top of the ocean to probably hunt for their food as there's not enough food on land to sustain their diet. So essentially they can't go and go into the interior of, say, Alaska and hunt for hunt for food because they're purely carnivores and that they can't. Um, there's just not enough food to sustain them uh, in that area. So they need to use the sea ice to hunt. And they actually, I was re- reading into this. It was, I got sucked into reading about polar bears because they're really cool animals. But um, they have to go and they actually need the fat um, from the seals that they hunt, which live in the water. And um, they'll catch them typically on these icebergs that the seals hang out on. Um, they need the fat to be able to sustain them because they won't eat for weeks on end. So they'll eat seal and the fat and then they'll burn that fat over weeks. And then, um, yeah, so they need the sea ice to properly hunt. And, um, yeah, so human caused climate change. This is kind of an introduction to the bigger, larger topic of climate change, which has also kind of been in the news recently, um, as especially as we get into politics and the U S presidency, uh, we have a comment. Oh, oh, this is from the discussion earlier. Yeah, so we have a comment from uh, Lumila Vladimirovna. I'm surprised by large fines in the USA from or for moving from renting apartment before. Uh, oh, so I'm leaving. So you would say it's like uh, moving before your lease ends. That's what, what that would be the right way to say it, I guess. Uh, that's um, yeah. There are fines for that. Um, so a lot of leases work differently in the United, I, I don't know how they work in other countries or in Russia specifically at all, but the way that they work in the United States is you go and when you sign a lease, you'll sign a contract. Um, and this is a legal binding contract to pay. And there's a clause out saying that if you want to terminate your lease early, you have to pay a certain fine. Typically it's a month's rent. So you'll have to pay up to, if you're paying a thousand dollars a month, which is a pretty common price in the United States, especially if you live closer to cities, um, stay even for like a studio apartment. Um, it's um, you'll probably have to pay an extra thousand dollars or you'll lose. So in the United States, we also put this thing now called a security deposit, whereas we'll go and it's typically first month's rent. Um, you put it down and that's held by the landlord and they'll use that money uh, when you move out um, when you move out, like they'll go and inspect your apartment and say there's a hole in the wall or something because you had a crazy party or whatever. Um, that'll them fixing that. That's going to come out of that security deposit. So you lose that money typically when you lose, and a lot of times, it, a lot of people lose it. Um, just normally from normal wear and tear that happens. Um, but there's a lot of laws governing this kind of thing. Uh, I recommend if you come to the United States, don't. Uh, don't make under the table agreements for housing. You want to do stuff officially and have stuff written down on paper. Uh, that'll save you from um, getting uh, taken advantage of. So, yeah, um, but there are large fines. A lot of times, though, you can actually sign month to month agreements. So you just pay every month and that's not going to be as binding. So if you don't know where you're going to be in six months, it's it would be smarter to sign that kind of agreement um, but the rent is going to be variable every month. So as the market changes, they'll be willing to charge five dollars more, ten dollars. It's really never less, but um, five dollars more, ten dollars more, or something every month. So that's why people sign longer contracts. And I sorry, this is such a long winded uh, answer. I I, ju- I literally just moved like uh, about a month ago. So so I have all this inside knowledge now. But um. Yeah. Uh, so when you sign that year long contract, you are locked in or your the price can't change. You sign the contract for that price. So it saves you from uh, the price being uh, variable and going up for that whole year. So if you know where you're going to be in a year, it's smart to sign a year long contract. And typically that it's typically monthly one uh, six months or a full year is the contract length. Um, yeah. And we have another question from Oksana. Um why do Americans eat so many genetically modified food or is that just a stereotype? I think that's a thing that's uh, everywhere. So genetically modified food, I mean, even um, uh, it's like uh, gardening and like, I mean, uh, humans have been ge- uh, genetically modifying food and using genetic uh, nat- uh, selection, whatever. Um, oh my God, I'm forgetting the words. I haven't taken a science class in quite some time, but um, they have, they're using... Um, 
selective, uh, I guess, breeding or um, for food to make it more better than for human consumption. So I know I was reading an article and I know that corn originally started out like it was the size of just your uh, fingernail. But now it's obviously like this long. So clearly, um, over the course of thousands of years, humans have just genetically uh, modified them through selective breeding. Yeah, selective methods, exactly. To effect. So it's not necessarily a negative thing. It's genetically modified food. It's, um, it's pr- very common in, in all society, all culture. So uh, it's just kind of how humans eat. But um, I guess there is a stereotype behind that, that uh, hum- uh, Americans eat a lot of fake food. I think you're looking for the word processed. Um, would be the right. Uh, it's not necessarily GMO. Um, so it's not necessarily, yeah, they're not, ne- it's not necessarily the GMOs, but a lot of Americans, we do eat a lot of processed food. Uh, that is pretty typical of the United States. And I think in the United States, especially, there's a really big disconnect from food to where the food comes from. So just packaged chicken, you just, you always just forget that it actually comes from a live animal. So anyway, um, let's get back into climate change a little bit. And this actually ties in a little bit because eating is, uh, and food is a big part of climate change and, uh, the way, especially Americans eat and the way humans eat is negative for, uh, the climate. So, uh, human caused climate change has decreased the amount of sea ice by over 13% this past second. That doesn't sound like that large of a number, but that's over one tenth of it. So, yeah, it's uh, so that I mean, it, it is a large number when you look at add it up. So and that is the sea ice everywhere, not just the Arctic, too. So the Arctic has been hit especially hard through climate change. So, um, yeah, let's go to our next slide. And we have some polar bears. Um, actually, I believe this is taking uh, Russia, actually. And um, this, that's actually in Siberia. They, it's really. um. Uh, it's not a, they actually aren't, um, that's like the least well-known po- group of population where they really don't have a ton of data on actual polar bears, um, is in Siberia, but they keep a lot of data in Alaska and Northern Canada. Um, but as it gets colder in the farther North you get, typically there's the, there's less data on the, uh, polar bear populations and their travels. Yeah. Di- uh, Dina, Dina says, guys, the whole world eats GMO food these days. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. No, uh, they do. We do. Anyway, uh, let's go to the next slide, and we can see that. So the red line, this kind of shows the melting of the Arctic ice. Uh, the red line is um, the average minimum. So this is the minimum of the amount of ice from 81 to 2010. And a simple nine years later, the um, ice in September is much lower um so that's just a visual to see that wow it's actually 10 percent is pretty significant um so this is clearly negatively affecting um the uh polar bear populations um and making it more difficult for them to eat uh eat and find food and survive and uh and their species to flourish also we're cool fun fact i don't know if it's actually a cool fun fact but definitely a fact about polar bears is they are the only animals that actively hunt humans which is crazy so they are literally like our only natural predator i don't know i i, I think my friend my uh, really good friend from college loves polar bears so uh, he's told me that uh, fact a thousand times so that's crazy so anyway uh yeah this is just a visual to see and this is uh, the arctic and um to see um so yeah so if we go to our next slide we have a little history of climate change in the united states so timothy prokofiev uh says don't you think that the danger of global warming is a bit overestimated there are many climate changes even during the middle ages and humanity had no connection to it um yes there uh climate change it can be cyclical um but what the is looked at is the amount of carbon uh dioxide in the air which is a greenhouse gas um and ever since the Industrial Revolution, which I'm going to get into, it has absolutely skyrocketed. So, um, which has led to much uh, higher and quicker rates of warming. So, uh, species are unable to adapt to it. So, no, I, I personally don't think it's overestimated at all, the science behind it. Um, so, what I've learned uh, from taking a lot of uh, ecology classes in school and such is that 97 out of 100 scientists will tell you that it is not overestimated. 
that it is a real problem and serious. So and needs to be uh, actively dealt with. Um, but yeah, no, I, I know there's a lot of doubt with, uh, and that's a pretty common opinion for a lot of people. And uh, yeah, I just. I think uh, just look into it uh, and do some more research because I think uh, it, it is really it's the amount of carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere now in the parts the parts per million is uh, exponentially higher than it was at the start of the Industrial Revolution. So that's um, and that is purely from human causes. So anyway, uh, so the history of the climate change in the United States is the Industrial revolution uh, led to the dramatically increased production of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere with the burning of coal. Um, and I know you, there's like a lot of visual visuals from um, um, like uh, England during this where Manchester kind of turned into the big coal city in Liverpool. So Liverpool was the importer and the exporter of goods. Um, yeah, no, no. So the coal came from Northern England was used in Manchester, turned into the massive manufacturing center. Um, and then uh, moved to, um, it was shipped out from Liverpool. So there's a lot of images of like black buildings. So it's, it's very visual too. I mean, until the, uh, ex especially at the onset of it. So these glasses have a warming effect on the average temperature. Essentially, you got to think of it like, um, they're insulating the atmosphere, so sunlight comes in, sunlight can't go out, get out. So uh, that just slowly increases the temperature, melts ices, rises sea levels. It can be dangerous, and for in 50 years, people um, have uh, the, think that sea levels will be high enough to uh, threaten a lot of uh, coastal areas. So, and also, it's a reason that a lot of storms are a lot more uh, powerful is the warmer uh, levels and the higher uh, the warmer water. Uh, leads to uh, larger hurricanes and storms, and you can actually see that physically on um, its effect. So, um, in the nineteen so in the nineteen sixties, I obviously skipped over a ton of uh, this, but it was um, CO two emissions were accurately accurately measured through the Keeling curve. Um, this was kind of the first really big scientific uh, um, set of data points where they are able where he effectively tracked the increase of temperature uh, and its direct relation to CO2 emissions. So a lot of people go, it's um, say that, oh, well, this year was warmer than last year. I can't see climate change. It's more about the average warmth. So that if even if the average temperature in the world increases by a single degree, it's going to have dramatic, it has dramatic effects on a lot of um, places. So more of uh, places in more harsh climates so especially in desert areas it leads to more drying up of water and increased famine um and in places with uh in the north it leads to the quick melting of ice so in more uh temperate climates and such you don't really see it as well but in the really dramatic uh dramatic climates you could visually uh see it so the keeling curve was kind of the first scientific way that that was really measured and was able to uh actively track um, the increase of climate change, especially since the 1960s. I mean, it's been massive as more countries in the world has, have developed. Um, so the first global agreement to fight climate change was the uh, Kyoto Protocol. Uh, Clinton signed the agreement, um, but George W. Bush backed out. So Lumila uh, Vladimirovna says, for what reason Bush backed out of the agreement to fight climate change? I believe it was purely p political. Um, a lot, and I'm going to get into the politics behind it, but a lot of climate change is political in the United States, unfortunately. Um, whereas a lot of conservative backers are large fossil fuel oil companies and stuff, because the United States is still a net exporter of oil. So um, there is, yeah, they, so, so there's a lot of like the politics behind it, because in the elections, there's a lot of financial backing that comes from oil lobbyists. It's called lobbying is where you'll have representatives from these large industries go and um, to go to uh, the political parties and be like, hey, we're going to give you two hundred million dollars if you back this certain thing in Congress and try to r reduce um, whatever restrictions on on our industry to make it cheaper for us. So that's uh, it's all politics uh, is why it's backed out. It's not. So anyway, um, so Al Gore, he actually ran for president against George W. Bush. He um, came out with a book called An Inconvenient Truth, which uh, really popularized climate change. 
and made it really uh, brought it to the forefront of American politics and the American thoughts and teachings in school and such. So, and he actually won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work in 2007. So the science behind it is clearly backed and, and is promoted in the international community of academia. But uh, in the United States, it has turned into a much more political issue. So anyway, we, if we go to the next slide, we can see a picture. I just wanted to show some images from the United States of the Industrial Revolution. Um, in the United States, the Industrial Revolution is synonymous with um, um, child labor and very, very harsh uh working conditions for people. Um, it, was very, it was very difficult for the growing worker class in the United States. Um, and this happened obviously all over the world. The United States is particularly bad. And I know um, the, uh, I, I'm a fan of old diaries and I was reading the diary of the Austrian Archduke Fr uh, Franz Ferdinand, the one who was assassinated by uh, the Serbian starting the First World War. And he said, his least favorite place in the entire world was New York City because he said it was the most disgusting city he's ever been in just due, just due to constant, just the amount of like the quick rapid industrialization of the city and the poor living conditions for the tenements. Uh, and there's a, there, this is a whole entire topic that you can go into is just the development in New York City. Um, so yeah, that's kind of synonymous with the industrial revolution. In the United States, um, if you want a good book on that, if this topic interests you at all, especially in the United States, I recommend you read uh, Upton Sinclair's *The Jungle*. That's uh, kind of one of the big required readings for uh, American students, and it actually is a socialist novel in nature, um, where Sinclair is trying to promote socialist values through his um, work, but. It actually resonated more so in the United States as it gave the ins to the meatpacking industry. Um, and this picture on the left is a little boy of canners, and on the right, they're uh, working looms. So definitely look in uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair if you want to see the gross and grittiness of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this is kind of one, another thing that has been really popular in um, uh, being taught in American schools. It's called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. Um, and as you can see, so on the top floor was the Triangle uh, Shirtwaist Factory where they made shirtwaists. Uh, I don't really know what that is. I think it's an article of clothing of some sort, obviously. But um, And uh, there was, during the day in the United States, they would lock the workers in to make sure that they didn't leave. Um, and there were no fire regulations and the building caught on fire and almost, and I, th I believe actually every single woman working there died. So I know a lot of them jumped out the windows to try to save themselves, but it was the top floor and it was, it's just a tragedy. So this kind of led to uh, a huge push for workers rights in the United States. And you saw the, really the development of unions through this. Um, yeah, that just, this is just a little backstory. If people have joined me before, they know that I like to go a little too deep into backstory for these things. But anyway, uh, if we go to the next slide, we have, this is the Keeling curve. So this is the, um, CO2 fraction of parts per million. Um, and you can see from 1916 to 2020, it is uh, massively increased. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't look like there's any way for starting uh, of this stopping. So I, that is the uh, issue. That is the major factor behind human-caused climate changes. We're just pumping too much CO2 into the atmosphere at much higher rate than it is able to process it. Um, through plans, which increases the average temperature of the Earth. So yeah, so um, here's a little just data set for you. And I know that they track this um, through historical temperatures. They've actually tracked it all the way back to uh, the start of the Industrial Revolution. You see it skyrocket with the just even the growth of human population too. Um, so anyway, uh, if we go to the next slide, we uh, this is a picture of Al Gore uh, giving a climate talk, and he was the uh, presidential nominee in 2007. So, uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide. And we have climate change as a political topic. This is President Trump on the left. Um, so in the United States, climate change has used, been used as a political agenda. So as I've said earlier, um, the climate change uh, is a big issue. Um, a lot of fossil fuel and large companies and big industries don't want these econo uh, not economic, sorry, uh, ecological restrictions on them. Uh, environmental restrictions because it uh, makes their um, industry more expensive. 
So they'll go and they'll lobby uh, members of Congress and political parties to try to push their agenda through Congress. And this is very common for both sides. This is just a very common American thing. It's called lobbying. Um, it's just part of politics. So, uh, so yeah, so politicians use climate change as the opposite to promoting big industry. Exactly. So uh, a lot of President Trump's rhetoric during the, his uh, election in 2016 was that um, these environmental restrictions are uh, fighting, are hindering the his whole the whole thing of make America great again. So, which was the party slogan he ran on. So that was kind of uh, he, uh, one of the platforms he ran on, and clearly it had it resonated to you know, the people of the U.S. and a lot of people, uh, and he was elected in. So, um, and he's actually done stuff typically. So a lot of times there's a lot of empty promises towards what they're going to do. So he said he would revoke environmental restrictions, and uh, he has. So he. Uh, the plan is to revoke a hundred of them by the end of his four-year presidency. But and so far he's revoked sixty-eight of the environmental restrictions. So this is kind of um, emissions control, essentially um, making sure that people the pollution uh, pollution, making sure that output is a lot cleaner. Um, a lot of industrial waste isn't going directly into water sources. Uh, making a lot of this is on nuclear reactors, whereas they um, they pump a lot of hot water into rivers, and this uh, just decimates the um, po- uh, the natural po- uh, population, the ecology of the rivers um, and such, um, of, of the fish, because it, it just, the water's too hot for the fish to live in anymore. And this is, uh, and the water's only increased by like one to two degrees on average, but animals are just so um, adapted to their specific environments that they can't survive in this. Um, and so I actually brought this up because the, there was a letter to the Federal Reserve by a large number of U.S. financial institutions to go and um, say um, to ask um, essentially to push the agenda of climate change is real and it needs to be ch- uh, something needs to be done about it. And this is this is a little abnormal because typically these large financial institutions are fall very uh, more so conservative as part of big business. So this was kind of a a bigger moment where maybe larger maybe attitudes towards climate change are shifting in the United States. I don't really know. This is just a little bit of speculation by me. So anyway, uh, if we go to the next slide, we just have a um, a pre- uh, nominee, uh, Joe Biden. And uh, former, he was a former vice president, and he was a big pusher for climate, um, for fighting climate change. And he just actually came out with it, his new economic package uh, for the if he for if he is elected, um, promoting uh, how he is going to tie climate change with the promotion of U.S. homegrown industry. So anyway, if we go to the next slide, we got our second discussion, and we are have about probably about ten minutes left. So we're going to kind of. Uh, I just want to introduce these, and I'm going to go through our last uh, part um, of our discussion today. So the question is, um, what measurements can be taken to reduce human cost of climate change? Um, these, this is a pretty basic one. And then why in the United States has climate change become a political issue? Um, and then finally, my question is, is climate change like a popular topic within Russia? So do people in Russia really talk? Is this a conversation that they're having? I know in younger, in the United States, for among younger people, um, this is a really big topic and a really big conversation uh, because there's the ad- a lot of that. Uh, there's a prevailing attitude that we're going to have to live in this world um, much longer than our parents and our forefathers will. So, we want to leave it a better place for our children. Um, that's kind of, it's a really popular opinion in the United States, especially among young people. Um, and that actually, I feel, has crossed party lines uh, personally, just from my personal experiences, for more of just uh, how young uh, younger people think. Um, so why has uh, it become a political issue? I think it's kind of become a political issue. It's just through lobbying, as I've kind of go to. And then, um, yeah, so I'm excited to see what you guys have to say. Uh, about this. But anyway, if we go to the next slide, we're going to go and kind of touch our final topic. Sorry if I'm rushing through this. Uh, I think I spent a little too much time on uh, polar bears because I, I love polar bears. But um, anyway, so so um, this is, we have a, we saw a new comet in the United States. So this is co- called Comet Neowise. So NASA's Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer Neowise discovered a new comet on 
March 27th, 2020. Um, this comma was visible for the first time in 6,800 years uh, this year. And it was visible from July 15th to July 23rd, uh, which is really cool. So it is still visible right now, actually, um, for one more day, if you want to see it. Um, and then it'll be gone for another 6,800 years. And I believe that will be pro I'm going to I'm going to put my money on saying that is probably going to be after my lifetime. Um, I don't know. Science is crazy. But um, anyway, so it's um. So the comet is made up of leftover building blocks of the solar system, which is just rock and ice, really, which is kind of cool, which is actually very cool if you're into it. Um, and then the ta its tail can span for 10 million miles, which is I thought was crazy because it kind of shows um, how distance is so relative to where you are in perspective. And yeah, anyway, so I'm going to uh, I got a bunch of pictures for this, so I'm happy to show. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, we can see this. So this picture is actually from the ISS. Um, it's actually an inverted picture. It's supposed to be, uh, I flipped it upside down because it shows the comet in a cooler um, way with the arching down, kind of like a traditional comet that you think. So that you could see the comet in the, uh, in the left-hand side of the screen, or I guess if I'm projecting maybe the right-hand side, but um, it should be the left-hand side. Anyway, it has, uh, its tail um, is, as you can see, quite long, um, and it's really bright and cool. So... Yeah, so uh, also we have an answer from Tatiana or Lova. Uh, less polluting the air. Yep, water will be uh, do good for our planet and decrease the op decrease the opportunity of climate change. Definitely, I think increasing people's access to clean water um, would uh, definitely factor in to uh, being a positive thing for climate change and also uh, preserving it and maybe turning off your faucets uh, when you're brushing your teeth, that kind of stuff. I think little things can definitely. Uh, if everybody do, does them, it's like wearing a mask. If everybody wears a mask, COVID's going to decrease. So it's going to, it's similar to that. If everybody's uh, conserving water, it will have a larger effect um, as, as the collective humanity. So uh, if we go to our next picture, we have, this is the, um, how you can spot the um, comet from the United States. So this is looking northwest after sunset and we'll see July 23rd. We're pretty high in the sky at this point. Um, I really don't know much about stars and anything, but it's between uh, Arcturus and Polaris. Uh, and then if we go to the next slide, this is in Colorado. Uh, I hope our planet will never come across a comet. Oh, that you'll never, that will never be hit by a comet. Um, yeah, no, that would, that would probably stink. That would, <laughs> that's, uh, that's one theory for why the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, rapid climate change through um, a common large volcanic eruption. So that's a theory, but yeah, no, definitely. Um, so this is a really cool visual from, and you can see actually all the campers out there watching it um, in Colorado, uh, in the United States. And then if we go to the next slide, this is actually over a uh, farm in France, which is cool. So you can kind of see that it's going over, um, you can see it across the world. And then lastly, our final picture is the comment behind um, oh, Il Dome in uh, Florence, uh, the dome, Brunelleschi's dome um, in, uh, yeah, in Florence, Italy. So, yeah, so I thought it was really cool, all these images and kind of fun to show. So if we go to the next slide, we can see our, we have uh, our final discussion, actually. Um, yeah, and so we have about five minutes left today. So, um yeah, thank you, Lumilla. Uh, I, I really liked the pictures, the comment. It, it was it was fun. It was actually a lot of fun looking for them and finding them. So definitely look them up. And uh, hopefully, if you have time, maybe you can look up uh, ways you can see it for, I guess, today, tonight. Well, I mean, this evening, the 22nd, and the, tw the evening of the 23rd. Um, so, yeah. So have you ever seen any natural phenomenon outside the atmosphere? Um, so, like, I'm talking about, like, meteor showers, comets, um, that kind of stuff. And then this is kind of a broad and ended one. Do you think there's life outside of Earth and will we ever find it? Okay, so Dina says that there's not much, uh, it's not discussed in media much and there's no, no such classes in schools. Yeah, I've, I've heard that um, uh, in contrast to climate change, the melting of the ice um, allows for northern shipping, uh, the promotion of northern shipping. So I, I know there are a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of parties in a lot of countries actually who have economic interests in um, melting of the ice, and the United States does as well um, in uh, the northern Alaska. But we don't do a lot of trading 
out of there. Um, so yeah, but um, I know Canada does as well. Uh, but no, definitely. Um, thank you for the comment, uh, Dina. So yeah, uh, have you seen any natural? So oh yeah, do you think there's life outside of Earth? Will we ever find it? I personally think there is. I think that the atmosphere is just way too big, and there's so many like coincidences of potentially having a there's just the chance of another place having the correct atmosphere the perfect atmosphere for a life is um i think is definitely possible i don't know whether how advanced the life would be but i think it's definitely possible and um will we ever find it i i, I have no idea um i'm i'm hoping probably not in our lifetime it's kind of opens up the question of if there's life where is it so um, if it's out there, like, why haven't we found it already? So why haven't they found us? So anyway, but who knows? Somewhere else they might be having a similar conversation today. So anyway, guys, uh, yeah, I haven't seen any natural phenomena, actually. I wanted to, I've always wanted to see a meteor shower, and I think I just don't do my research. But I think I could definitely look into it and kind of find it. There's definitely a lot of stuff. And I know light pollution is a big issue that makes it more difficult. Um to uh to see certain things so yeah oksana uh um bukova says there's a movie the martian yeah with matt damon good movie um you should uh yeah i have seen that i like that a lot where he grows and he just and he gets stuck on mars and he survives on grown potatoes really good movie definitely recommend it it was on hbo for a while but i don't think it is anymore um but yeah really good movie i highly recommend it um Ludmila Vladimirovna says hail was on this June in Moscow area. I'm s assuming that you're saying, um, like, uh, not hail, but like, um, are you talking about hail, like actual, like ice? And cause hail is just, uh, it's just like frozen snow. Um, and a lot of times it's really, big. sometimes it's really big. Or are you talking about more of like a, a like a shower, like a meteor shower kind of thing? Um, but that's crazy. Hail in June in Moscow. That's kind of crazy. So, yeah, snowballs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know uh, there's the co popular expression like hail as large as golf balls, which is kind of crazy. Um, Tim face said, I heard that the conditions of one of the Jupiter or Saturn moons were uh, was quite fine to have life in it. But if it exists, it could only be microorganic life. Um, interesting. OK, yeah, look, at. I know a lot of them are frozen. Um, but anyway. So anyway, guys, uh, we're going to go to the last side, just questions. Um, and here, if you have any last comments, quickly throw them out. But um, I just want to first off say thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I hope this presentation is a little different today. Uh, I tried to stay away from the big hot topic issues. And um, yeah, I just want to say thanks. Um, always a pleasure to talk to you guys and uh, learn with you because you guys teach me so much. Um, so before I sign off, I just want to say check out the um, uh, page for the American Center Moscow. Tons of cool content. I'm going to go back and actually finish watching that George R.R. R. Martin uh, video and uh, check it out. But anyway, guys, uh, thank you very much. I hope you guys have a great rest of your evening, um, wherever you guys are, and that you guys are healthy and safe. And I will see you next week. So um, anyway, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, enjoy your day.